Chapter Twenty One of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sir Thomas's return made a striking change in the ways of the family, independent of lovers' vows. Under his government, Mansfield was an altered place. Some members of their society sent away, and the spirits of many others saddened. It was all sameness and gloom compared with the past, a sombre family party rarely enlivened. There was little intercourse with the parsonage. Sir Thomas, drawing back from intimacies in general, was particularly disinclined at this time for any engagements but in one quarter. The Rushworths were the only addition to his own domestic circle which he could solicit. Edmund did not wonder that such should be his father's feelings, nor could he regret anything but the exclusion of the Grants. "'But they,' he observed to Fanny, "'have a claim. They seem to belong to us. They seem to be part of ourselves. I could wish my father were more sensible of their very great attention to my mother and sisters while he was away. I'm afraid they may feel themselves neglected. But the truth is that my father hardly knows them. They had not been here a twelvemonth when he left England. If he knew them better, he would value their society as it deserves, for they are, in fact, exactly the sort of people he would like. We are sometimes a little in want of animation among ourselves. My sisters seem out of spirits, and Tom is certainly not at his ease. Dr. and Mrs. Grant would enliven us, and make our evenings pass away with more enjoyment even to my father. Do you think so? said Fanny. In my opinion, my uncle would not like any addition. I think he values the very quietness you speak of, and that the repose of his own family circle is all he wants. And it does not appear to me that we are more serious than we used to be, I mean, before my uncle went abroad. As well as I can recollect, it was always much the same. There was never much laughing in his presence, or if there is any difference, it is not more, I think, than such an absence has a tendency to produce at first. There must be a sort of shyness, but I cannot recollect that our evenings formerly were ever merry, except when my uncle was in town. No young people's are, I suppose, when those they look up to are at home. I believe you are right, Fanny, was his reply after a short consideration. I believe our evenings are rather returned to what they were, than assuming a new character. The novelty was in their being lively. Yet how strong the impression that only a few weeks will give! I have been feeling as if we had never lived so before. I suppose I am graver than other people," said Fanny. The evenings do not appear long to me. I love to hear my uncle talk of the West Indies. I could listen to him for an hour together. It entertains me more than many other things have done, but then I am unlike other people, I dare say. Why should you dare say that? Smiling. Do you want to be told that you are only unlike other people in being more wise and discreet? But when did you or anybody ever get a compliment from me, Fanny? Go to my father if you want to be complimented. He will satisfy you. Ask your uncle what he thinks, and you will hear compliments enough. And though they may be chiefly on your person, you must put up with it, and trust to his seeing as much beauty of mind in time. Such language was so new to Fanny that it quite embarrassed her. Your uncle thinks you very pretty, dear Fanny, and that is the long and the short of the matter. Anybody but myself would have made something more of it, and anybody but you would resent that you had not been thought very pretty before. But the truth is that your uncle never did admire you till now, and now he does. Your complexion is so improved, and you have gained so much countenance, and your figure. Nay, Fanny, do not turn away about it. It is but an uncle. If you cannot bear an uncle's admiration, what is to become of you? You must really begin to harden yourself to the idea of being worth looking at. You must try not to mind growing up into a pretty woman. Oh, don't talk so! Don't talk so! cried Fanny, distressed by more feelings than he was aware of. But seeing that she was distressed, he had done with the subject, and only added more seriously. Your uncle is disposed to be pleased with you in every respect, and I only wish you would talk to him more. You are one of those who are too silent in the evening circle. But I do talk to him more than I used. I'm sure I do. 
Did not you hear me ask him about the slave trade last night? I did, and was in hopes the question would be followed up by others. It would have pleased your uncle to be inquired of farther. And I longed to do it, but there was such a dead silence. And while my cousins were sitting by without speaking a word, or seeming at all interested in the subject, I did not like. I thought it would appear as if I wanted to set myself off at their expense, by showing a curiosity and pleasure in his information which he must wish his own daughters to feel. Miss Crawford was very right in what she said of you the other day, that you seemed almost as fearful of notice and praise as other women were of neglect. We were talking of you at the parsonage, and those were her words. She has great discernment. I know nobody who distinguishes characters better. For so young a woman it is remarkable. She certainly understands you better than you are understood by the greater part of those who have known you so long. And with regard to some others, I can perceive from occasional lively hints, the unguarded expressions of the moment, that she could define many as accurately did not delicacy forbid it. I wonder what she thinks of my father. She must admire him as a fine-looking man, with most gentlemanlike, dignified, consistent manners. But perhaps having seen him so seldom, his reserve may be a little repulsive. Could they be much together, I feel sure of their liking each other. He would enjoy her liveliness, and she has talents to value his powers. I wish they met more frequently. I hope she does not suppose there is any dislike on his side. She must know herself too secure of the regard of all the rest of you, said Fanny with half a sigh, to have any such apprehension. And Sir Thomas's wishing just at first to be only with his family is so very natural that she can argue nothing from that. After a little while, I dare say, we shall be meeting again in the same sort of way, allowing for the difference of the time of year. This is the first October that she has passed in the country since her infancy. I do not call Tunbridge or Cheltenham the country. And November is a still more serious month, and I can see that Mrs. Grant is very anxious for her not finding Mansfield dull as winter comes on. Fanny could have said a great deal, but it was safer to say nothing and leave untouched all Miss Crawford's resources, her accomplishments, her spirits, her importance, her friends, lest it should betray her into any observation seemingly unhandsome. Miss Crawford's kind opinion of herself deserved at least a grateful forbearance, and she began to talk of something else. "'Tomorrow, I think, my uncle dines at Southerton, and you and Mr. Bertram, too. We shall be quite a small party at home.' I hope my uncle may continue to like Mr. Rushworth. That is impossible, Fanny. He must like him less after tomorrow's visit, for we shall be five hours in his company. I should dread the stupidity of the day if it were not a much greater evil to follow. The impression it must leave on Sir Thomas. He cannot much longer deceive himself. I am sorry for them all, and would give something that Rushworth and Maria had never met. In this quarter, indeed, disappointment was impending over Sir Thomas. Not all his good will for Mr. Rushworth, not all Mr. Rushworth's deference for him, could prevent him from soon discerning some part of the truth, that Mr. Rushworth was an inferior young man, as ignorant in business as in books, with opinions in general unfixed, and without seeming much aware of it himself. He had expected a very different son-in-law, and beginning to feel grave on Maria's account, tried to understand her feelings. Little observation there was necessary to tell him that indifference was the most favourable state they could be in. Her behaviour to Mr. Rushworth was careless and cold. She could not, did not like him. Sir Thomas resolved to speak seriously to her. Advantageous as would be the alliance, and long-standing and public as was the engagement, her happiness must not be sacrificed to it. Mr. Rushworth had, perhaps, been accepted on too short an acquaintance, and on knowing him better, she was repenting. With solemn kindness Sir Thomas addressed her, told her his fears, inquired into her wishes, entreated her to be open and sincere, and assured her that every inconvenience should be braved, and the connection entirely given up, if she felt herself unhappy in the prospect of it. He would act for her and release her. Maria had a moment's struggle as she listened, and only a moment's. When her father ceased, 
She was able to give her answer immediately, decidedly, and with no apparent agitation. She thanked him for his great attention, his paternal kindness, but he was quite mistaken in supposing she had the smallest desire of breaking through her engagement, or was sensible of any change of opinion or inclination since her forming it. She had the highest esteem for Mr. Rushworth's character and disposition, and could not have a doubt of her happiness with him. Sir Thomas was satisfied, too glad to be satisfied, perhaps, to urge the matter quite so far as his judgment might have dictated to others. It was an alliance which he could not have relinquished without pain, and thus he reasoned. Mr. Rushworth was young enough to improve. Mr. Rushworth must and would improve in good society, and if Maria could now speak so securely of her happiness with him, speaking certainly without the prejudice, the blindness of love, she ought to be believed. Her feelings probably were not acute, he had never supposed them to be so, but her comforts might not be less on that account, and if she could dispense with seeing her husband a leading, shining character, there would certainly be everything else in her favour. A well-disposed young woman, who did not marry for love, was in general but the more attached to her own family, and the nearness of Southerton to Mansfield must naturally hold out the greatest temptation, and would in all probability be a continual supply of the most amiable and innocent enjoyments. Such and such like were the reasonings of Sir Thomas, happy to escape the embarrassing evils of a rupture, the wonder, the reflections, the reproach that must attend it, happy to secure a marriage which would bring him such an addition of respectability and influence, and very happy to think anything of his daughter's disposition that was most favourable for the purpose. To her the conference closed as satisfactorily as to him. She was in a state of mind to be glad that she had secured her fate beyond recall, that she had pledged herself anew to Southerton, that she was safe from the possibility of giving Crawford the triumph of governing her actions and destroying her prospects, and retired in proud resolve, determined only to behave more cautiously to Mr. Rushworth in future, that her father might not again be suspecting her. Had Sir Thomas applied to his daughter within the first three or four days after Henry Crawford's leaving Mansfield, before her feelings were at all tranquillized, before she had given up every hope of him, or absolutely resolved on enduring his rival, her answer might have been different. But after another three or four days, when there was no return, no letter, no message, no symptom of a softened heart, no hope of advantage from separation, her mind became cool enough to seek all the comfort that pride and self-revenge could give. Henry Crawford had destroyed her happiness, but he should not know that he had done it. He should not destroy her credit, her appearance, her prosperity, too. He should not have to think of her as pining in the retirement of Mansfield for him, rejecting Southerton and London, independence and splendour for his sake. Independence was more needful than ever, the want of it at Mansfield more sensibly felt. She was less and less able to endure the restraint which her father imposed. The liberty which his absence had given was now become absolutely necessary. She must escape from him and Mansfield as soon as possible, and find consolation in fortune and consequence, bustle and the world, for a wounded spirit. Her mind was quite determined, and varied not. To such feelings delay, even the delay of much preparation, would have been an evil, and Mr. Rushworth could hardly be more impatient for the marriage than herself. In all the important preparations of the mind she was complete, being prepared for matrimony by an hatred of home, restraint, and tranquillity, by the misery of disappointed affection, and contempt of the man she was to marry. The rest might wait. The preparations of new carriages and furniture might wait for London and spring, when her own taste could have fair play. The principles all being agreed in this respect, it soon appeared that a very few weeks would be sufficient for such arrangements as must precede the wedding. Mrs. Rushworth was quite ready to retire, and make way for the fortunate young woman whom her dear son had selected, and very early in November removed herself, her maid, her footman, and her chariot, with true dowager propriety, to Bath, there to parade over the wonders of Southerton in her evening parties enjoying them as thoroughly, perhaps, in the animation of a card-table, as she had ever done on the spot. And before the middle of the same month the ceremony had taken place, which gave Southerton another mistress. It was a very proper wedding. The bride was elegantly dressed, the two bridesmaids were duly inferior, 
Her father gave her away, her mother stood with salts in her hand, expecting to be agitated, her aunt tried to cry, and the service was impressively read by Dr. Grant. Nothing could be objected to when it came under the discussion of the neighbourhood, except that the carriage which conveyed the bride and bridegroom and Julia from the church door to Southerton was the same chaise which Mr. Rushworth had used for a twelve-month before. In everything else the etiquette of the day might stand the strictest investigation. It was done, and they were gone. Sir Thomas felt as an anxious father must feel, and was indeed experiencing much of the agitation which his wife had been apprehensive of for herself, but had fortunately escaped. Mrs. Norris, most happy to assist in the duties of the day, by spending it at the park to support her sister's spirits, and drinking the health of Mr. and Mrs. Rushworth in a supernumerary glass or two, was all joyous delight. For she had made the match, she had done everything, and no one would have supposed from her confident triumph that she had ever heard of conjugal infelicity in her life, or could have the smallest insight into the disposition of the niece who had been brought up under her eye. The plan of the young couple was to proceed, after a few days, to Brighton, and take a house there for some weeks. Every public place was new to Maria, and Brighton is almost as gay in winter as in summer. When the novelty of amusement there was over, it would be time for the wider range of London. Julia was to go with them to Brighton. Since rivalry between the sisters had ceased, they had been gradually recovering much of their former good understanding, and were at least sufficiently friends to make each of them exceedingly glad to be with the other at such a time. Some other companion than Mr. Rushworth was of the first consequence to his lady, and Julia was quite as eager for novelty and pleasure as Maria, though she might not have struggled through so much to obtain them, and could better bear a subordinate situation. Their departure made another material change at Mansfield, a chasm which required some time to fill up. The family circle became greatly contracted, and though the Miss Bertrams had latterly added little to its gaiety, they could not but be missed. Even their mother missed them, and how much more their tender-hearted cousin, who wandered about the house and thought of them, and felt for them, with a degree of affectionate regret, which they had never done much to deserve. End of chapter 21 Of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fanny's consequence increased on the departure of her cousins. Becoming, as she then did, the only young woman in the drawing room, the only occupier of that interesting division of a family in which she had hitherto held so humble a third, it was impossible for her not to be more looked at, more thought of, and attended to, than she had ever been before and where is fanny became no uncommon question even without her being wanted for any one's convenience not only at home did her value increase but at the parsonage too in that house which she had hardly entered twice a year since mr norris's death she became a welcome an invited guest and in the gloom and dirt of a november day most acceptable to mary crawford her visits there, beginning by chance, were continued by solicitation. Mrs. Grant, really eager to get any change for her sister, could, by the easiest self-deceit, persuade herself that she was doing the kindest thing by Fanny, and giving her the most important opportunities of improvement in pressing her frequent calls. Fanny, having been sent into the village on some errand by her aunt Norris, was overtaken by a heavy shower close to the parsonage, and being descried from one of the windows endeavouring to find shelter under the branches and lingering leaves of an oak just beyond their premises, was forced, though not without some modest reluctance on her part, to come in. A civil servant she had withstood, but when Dr. Grant himself went out with an umbrella there was nothing to be done but to be very much ashamed, and to get into the house as fast as possible and to poor Miss Crawford, who had just been contemplating the dismal rain in a very desponding state of mind, sighing over the ruin of all her plan of exercise for that morning, and of every chance of seeing a single creature beyond themselves for the next twenty-four hours, the sound of a little bustle at the front door, and the sight of Miss Price dripping with wet in the vestibule, was delightful. The value of an event on a wet day in the country was most forcibly brought before her. 
She was all alive again directly, and among the most active in being useful to Fanny, in detecting her to be wetter than she would at first allow, and providing her with dry clothes. And Fanny, after being much obliged to submit to all this attention, and to being assisted and waited on by mistresses and maids, being also obliged, on returning downstairs, to be fixed in their drawing-room for an hour while the rain continued, the blessing of something fresh to see and think of was thus extended to Miss Crawford, and might carry on her spirits to the period of dressing and dinner. The two sisters were so kind to her, and so pleasant, that Fanny might have enjoyed her visit could she have believed herself not in the way, and could she have foreseen that the weather would certainly clear at the end of the hour, and save her from the shame of having Dr. Grant's carriage and horses out to take her home, with which she was threatened. As to anxiety for any alarm that her absence in such weather might occasion at home, she had nothing to suffer on that score for as her being out was known only to her two aunts, she was perfectly aware that none would be felt, and that, in whatever cottage Aunt Norris might choose to establish her during the rain, her being in such cottage would be indubitable to Aunt Bertram. It was beginning to look brighter, when Fanny, observing a harp in the room, asked some questions about it, which soon led to an acknowledgment of her wishing very much to hear it, and a confession, which could hardly be believed, of her having never yet heard it since its being in Mansfield. To Fanny herself it appeared a very simple and natural circumstance. She had scarcely ever been at the parsonage since the instrument's arrival, there had been no reason that she should. But Miss Crawford, calling to mind an early expressed wish on the subject, was concerned at her own neglect. And, "'Shall I play to you now?' And, "'What will you have?' were questions immediately following with the readiest good humour. She played accordingly, happy to have a new listener, and a listener who seemed so much obliged, so full of wonder at the performance, and who showed herself not wanting in taste. She played till Fanny's eyes, straying to the window on the weathers being evidently fair, spoke what she felt must be done. "'Another quarter of an hour,' said Miss Crawford, "'and we shall see how it will be. Do not run away the first moment of its holding up. Those clouds look alarming.' "'But they are passed over,' said Fanny. "'I have been watching them. This weather is all from the south.' "'South or north, I know a black cloud when I see it, and you must not set forward while it is so threatening. And, besides, I want to play something more to you, a very pretty piece, and your cousin Edmund's prime favourite. You must stay and hear your cousin's favourite.' Fanny felt that she must and though she had not waited for that sentence to be thinking of Edmund, such a memento made her particularly awake to his idea, and she fancied him sitting in that room again and again, perhaps in the very spot where she sat now, listening with constant delight to the favourite air, played, as it appeared to her, with superior tone and expression, and though pleased with it herself, and glad to like whatever was liked by him, she was more sincerely impatient to go away at the conclusion of it than she had ever been before and on this being evident, she was so kindly asked to call again, to take them in her walk whenever she could, to come and hear more of the harp, that she felt it necessary to be done, if no objection arose at home. Such was the origin of the sort of intimacy which took place between them within the first fortnight after the Miss Bertram's going away, an intimacy resulting principally from Miss Crawford's desire of something new, and which had little reality in Fanny's feelings. Fanny went to her every two or three days. It seemed a kind of fascination. She could not be easy without going. And yet it was without loving her, without ever thinking like her, without any sense of obligation for being sought after now when nobody else was to be had, and deriving no higher pleasure from her conversation than occasional amusement, and that often at the expense of her judgment, when it was raised by pleasantry on people or subjects which she wished to be respected. She went, however, and they sauntered about together many and half hour in Mrs. Grant's shrubbery, the weather being unusually mild for the time of year, and venturing sometimes even to sit down on one of the benches now comparatively unsheltered, remaining there perhaps till, in the midst of some tender ejaculation of Fanny's on the sweets of so protracted an autumn, they were forced, by the sudden swell of a cold gust shaking down the last few yellow leaves about them, to jump up and walk for warmth. "'This is pretty, very pretty,' said Fanny, looking around her as they were thus sitting together one day. 
Every time I come into this shrubbery I am more struck with its growth and beauty. Three years ago this was nothing but a rough hedgerow along the upper side of the field, never thought of as anything, or capable of becoming anything, and now it is converted into a walk, and it would be difficult to say whether most valuable as a convenience or an ornament, and perhaps, in another three years, we may be forgetting, almost forgetting what it was before. How wonderful, how very wonderful the operations of time, and the changes of the human mind! And following the latter train of thought, she soon afterwards added, If any one faculty of our nature may be called more wonderful than the rest, I do think it is memory. There seems something more speakingly incomprehensible in the powers, the failures, the inequalities of memory, than in any other of our intelligences. The memory is sometimes so retentive, so serviceable, so obedient, at others so bewildered and so weak, and at others again so tyrannic, so beyond control. We are, to be sure, a miracle every way, but our powers of recollecting and of forgetting do seem peculiarly past finding out." Miss Crawford, untouched and inattentive, had nothing to say, and Fanny, perceiving it, brought back her own mind to what she thought must interest. "'It may seem impertinent in me to praise, but I must admire the taste Mrs. Grant has shown in all this. There is such a quiet simplicity in the plan of the walk, not too much attempted." "'Yes,' replied Miss Crawford carelessly. "'It does very well for a place of this sort. One does not think of extent here, and between ourselves, till I came to Mansfield, I had not imagined a country parson ever aspired to a shrubbery, or anything of the kind." "'I am so glad to see the evergreens thrive,' said Fanny, in reply. My uncle's gardener always says the soil here is better than his own, and so it appears from the growth of the laurels and evergreens in general. The evergreen! How beautiful! How welcome! How wonderful the evergreen! When one thinks of it, how astonishing a variety of nature! In some countries we know the tree that sheds its leaf is the variety, but that does not make it less amazing that the same soil and the same sun should nurture plants differing in the first rule and law of their existence. You will think me rhapsodizing, but when I am out of doors, especially when I am sitting out of doors, I am very apt to get into this sort of wandering strain. One cannot fix one's eyes on the commonest natural production without finding food for a rambling fancy." "'To say the truth,' replied Miss Crawford, "'I am something like the famous doge at the court of Louis the Fourteenth, and may declare that I see no wonder in this shrubbery equal to seeing myself in it. If anybody had told me a year ago that this place would be my home, that I should be spending month after month here, as I have done, I certainly should not have believed them. I have now been here nearly five months, and moreover the quietest five months I ever passed." "'Too quiet for you, I believe." "'I should have thought so theoretically myself. But—' and her eyes brightened as she spoke. "'Take it all and all. I never spent so happy a summer. But then," with a more thoughtful air and lowered voice, there is no saying what it may lead to. Fanny's heart beat quick, and she felt quite unequal to surmising or soliciting anything more. Miss Crawford, however, with renewed animation, soon went on. I am conscious of being far better reconciled to a country residence than I had ever expected to be. I can even suppose it pleasant to spend half the year in the country, under certain circumstances. Very pleasant. An elegant, moderate-sized house in the centre of family connections, continual engagements among them, commanding the first society in the neighbourhood, looked up to, perhaps, as leading it even more than those of larger fortune, and turning from the cheerful round of such amusements to nothing worse than a tete-a-tete -tete with the person one feels most agreeable in the world. There is nothing frightful in such a picture. Is there, Miss Price? One need not envy the new Mrs. Rushworth with such a home as that." "'Envy Mrs. Rushworth!' was all that Fanny attempted to say. "'Come, come, it would be very unhandsome in us to be severe on Mrs. Rushworth, for I look forward to our owing her a great many gay, brilliant, happy hours. I expect we shall be all very much at Southerton another year. Such a match as Miss Bertram has made is a public blessing. 
for the first pleasures of Mr. Rushworth's wife must be to fill her house, and give the best balls in the country." Fanny was silent, and Miss Crawford relapsed into thoughtfulness, till suddenly looking up at the end of a few minutes, she exclaimed, "'Ah! here he is!' It was not Mr. Rushworth, however, but Edmund, who then appeared walking towards them with Mrs. Grant. "'My sister and Mr. Bertram! I am so glad your eldest cousin is gone, that he may be Mr. Bertram again. There is something in the sound of Mr. Edmund Bertram, so formal, so pitiful, so young a brother-like, that I detest it." "'How differently we feel!' cried Fanny. "'To me the sound of Mr. Bertram is so cold and nothing meaning, so entirely without warmth or character. It just stands for a gentleman, and that's all. But there is nobleness in the name of Edmund. It is a name of heroism and renown, of kings, princes, and knights, and seems to breathe the spirit of chivalry and warm affections." "'I grant you the name is good in itself, and Lord Edmund, or Sir Edmund, sound delightfully. But sink it under the chill, the annihilation of a mister, and Mr. Edmund is no more than Mr. John or Mr. Thomas. Well, shall we join and disappoint them of half their lecture upon sitting down out of doors at this time of year, by being up before they can begin?" Edmund met them with particular pleasure. It was the first time of his seeing them together since the beginning of that better acquaintance which he had been hearing of with great satisfaction. A friendship between two so very dear to him was exactly what he could have wished, and to the credit of the lover's understanding, be it stated, that he did not by any means consider Fanny as the only, or even as the greater gainer by such a friendship. "'Well,' said Miss Crawford, "'and do you not scold us for our imprudence? What do you think we have been sitting down for but to be talked to about it, and entreated and supplicated never to do so again?' "'Perhaps I might have scolded,' said Edmund, "'if either of you had been sitting down alone. But while you do wrong together, I can overlook a great deal." "'They cannot have been sitting long,' cried Mrs. Grant, "'for when I went up for my shawl I saw them from the staircase window, and then they were walking." "'And really,' added Edmund, "'the day is so mild that your sitting down for a few minutes can be hardly thought imprudent. Our weather must not always be judged by the calendar. We may sometimes take greater liberties in November than in May." "'Upon my word!' cried Miss Crawford. "'You are two of the most disappointing and unfeeling kind friends I ever met with. There is no giving you a moment's uneasiness. You do not know how much we have been suffering, nor what chills we have felt. But I have long thought Mr. Bertram one of the worst subjects to work on, in any little manoeuvre against common sense, that a woman could be plagued with. I had very little hope of him from the first. But you, Mrs. Grant, my sister, my own sister, I think I had a right to alarm you a little." "'Do not flatter yourself, my dearest Mary. You have not the smallest chance of moving me. I have my alarms, but they are quite in a different quarter, and if I could have altered the weather, you would have had a good sharp east wind blowing on you the whole time, for here are some of my plants which Robert will leave out, because the nights are so mild and I know the end of it will be that we shall have a sudden change of weather, a hard frost setting in all at once, taking everybody, at least Robert, by surprise, and I shall lose every one. And what is worse, Cook has just been telling me that the turkey, which I particularly wished not to be dressed till Sunday, because I know how much more Dr. Grant would enjoy it on Sunday after the fatigues of the day, will not keep beyond to-morrow. These are something like grievances, and make me think the weather most unseasonably close." "'The sweets of housekeeping in a country village,' said Miss Crawford archly, "'commend me to the nurserymen and the poulterer.' "'My dear child, commend Dr. Grant to the deanery of Westminster or St. Paul's, and I should be as glad of your nurseryman and poulterer as you could be but we have no such people in Mansfield. What would you have me do?" "'Oh, you can do nothing but what you do already. Be plagued very often, and never lose your temper." "'Thank you. But there is no escaping these little vexations, Mary. Live where we may, 
and when you are settled in town and i come to see you i dare say i shall find you with yours in spite of the nurseryman and the poulterer perhaps on their very account their remoteness and unpunctuality or their exorbitant charges and frauds will be drawing forth bitter lamentations i mean to be too rich to lament or feel anything of the sort a large income is the best recipe for happiness i ever heard of it certainly may secure all the myrtle and turkey part of it you intend to be very rich said edmund with a look which to fanny's eye had a great deal of serious meaning to be sure do not you do not we all i cannot intend anything which it must be so completely beyond my power to command miss crawford may choose her degree of wealth she has only to fix on her number of thousands a year and there can be no doubt of their coming my intentions are only not to be poor by moderation and economy and bringing down your wants to your income and all that i understand you and a very proper plan it is for a person at your time of life with such limited means and indifferent connections what can you want but a decent maintenance you have not much time before you and your relations are in no situation to do anything for you or to mortify you by the contrast of their own wealth and consequence be honest and poor by all means but i shall not envy you i do not much think i shall even respect you i have a much greater respect for those that are honest and rich your degree of respect for honesty rich or poor is precisely what i have no manner of concern with i do not mean to be poor poverty is exactly what i have determined against honesty in the something between in the middle state of worldly circumstances is all that i am anxious for you are not looking down on but i do look down upon it if it might have been higher i must look down upon anything contented with obscurity when it might rise to distinction but how may it rise how may my honesty at least rise to any distinction this was not so very easy a question to answer and occasioned an oh of some length from the fair lady before she could add you ought to be in parliament or you should have gone into the army ten years ago that is not so much to the purpose now and as to my being in parliament i believe i must wait till there is an especial assembly for the representation of younger sons who have little to live on no miss crawford he added in a more serious tone there are distinctions which i should be miserable if i thought myself without any chance absolutely without chance or possibility of obtaining but they are of a different character a look of consciousness as he spoke and what seemed a consciousness of manner on miss crawford's side as she made some laughing answer was sorrowful food for fanny's observation and finding herself quite unable to attend as she ought to mrs grant by whose side she was now following the others she had nearly resolved on going home immediately and only waited for courage to say so when the sound of the great clock at mansfield park striking three made her feel that she had really been much longer absent than usual and brought the previous self-inquiry of whether she should take leave or not just then and how to a very speedy issue with undoubting decision she directly began her adieus and edmund began at the same time to recollect that his mother had been inquiring for her and that he had walked down to the parsonage on purpose to bring her back fanny's hurry increased and without in the least expecting edmund's attendance she would have hastened away alone but the general pace was quickened and they all accompanied her into the house through which it was necessary to pass dr grant was in the vestibule and as they stopped to speak to him she found from edmund's manner that he did mean to go with her he too was taking leave she could not but be thankful in the moment of parting edmund was invited by dr grant to eat his mutton with him the next day and fanny had barely time for an unpleasant feeling on the occasion when mrs grant with sudden recollection turned to her and asked for the pleasure of her company too this was so new an attention so perfectly new a circumstance in the events of fanny's life that she was all surprise and embarrassment and while stammering out her great obligation and her but she did not suppose it would be in her power was looking at edmund for his opinion and help but edmund delighted with her having such an happiness offered and ascertaining with half a look and half a sentence that she had no objection but on her aunt's account could not imagine that his mother would make any difficulty of sparing her 
and therefore gave his decided open advice that the invitation should be accepted. And though Fanny would not venture, even on his encouragement, to such a flight of audacious independence, it was soon settled, that if nothing were heard to the contrary, Mrs. Grant might expect her. "'And you know what your dinner will be?' said Mrs. Grant, smiling. "'The turkey, and I assure you a very fine one. For, my dear,' turning to her husband, "'Cook insists upon the turkey's being dressed to-morrow.' "'Very well, very well, all the better,' cried Dr. Grant. "'I'm glad to hear you have anything so good in the house. But Miss Price and Mr. Edmund Bertram, I dare say, would take their chance. We none of us want to hear the bill of fare. A friendly meeting and not a fine dinner is all we have in view. A turkey or a goose or a leg of mutton, or whatever you and your cook choose to give us.' The two cousins walked home together and, except in the immediate discussion of this engagement, which Edmund spoke of with the warmest satisfaction, as so particularly desirable for her in the intimacy which he saw with so much pleasure established, it was a silent walk, for having finished that subject, he grew thoughtful and indisposed for any other. End of chapter 22《of Mansfield Park》by Jane Austen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But why should Mrs. Grant ask Fanny? said Lady Bertram. How came she to think of asking Fanny? Fanny never dines there, you know, in this sort of way. I cannot spare her, and I'm sure she does not want to go. Fanny, you do not want to go, do you? If you put such a question to her, cried Edmund, preventing his cousin's speaking. Fanny will immediately say no, but I am sure, my dear mother, she would like to go. And I can see no reason why she should not. I cannot imagine why Mrs. Grant should think of asking her. She never did before. She used to ask your sisters now and then, but she never asked Fanny. If you cannot do without me, ma'am, said Fanny, in a self-denying tone. But my mother will have my father with her all the evening. To be sure, so I shall. Suppose you take my father's opinion, ma'am. That's well thought of. So I will, Edmund. I will ask Sir Thomas, as soon as he comes in, whether I can do without her. As you please, ma'am, on that head. But I meant my father's opinion as to the propriety of the invitations being accepted or not. And I think he will consider it a right thing by Mrs. Grant, as well as by Fanny, that, being the first invitation, it should be accepted. I do not know. We will ask him, but he will be very surprised that Mrs. Grant should ask Fanny at all. There was nothing more to be said, or that could be said to any purpose, till Sir Thomas were present, but the subject involving, as it did, her own evening's comfort for the morrow, was so much uppermost in Lady Bertram's mind, that half an hour afterwards, on his looking in for a minute in his way from his plantation to his dressing-room, she called him back again when he had almost closed the door, with, "'Sir Thomas, stop a moment. I have something to say to you.' Her tone of calm languor, for she never took the trouble of raising her voice, was always heard and attended to, and Sir Thomas came back. Her story began, and Fanny immediately slipped out of the room, for to hear herself the subject of any discussion with her uncle was more than her nerves could bear. She was anxious, she knew, more anxious, perhaps, than she ought to be, for what was it, after all, whether she went or stayed? But if her uncle were to be a great while considering and deciding, and with very grave looks, and those grave looks directed to her, and at last decide against her, she might not be able to appear properly submissive and indifferent. Her cause, meanwhile, went on well. It began on Lady Bertram's part with, "'I have something to tell you that will surprise you.' "'Mrs. Grant has asked Fanny to dinner.' "'Well?' said Sir Thomas, as if waiting more to accomplish the surprise. "'Edmund wants her to go, but how can I spare her?' "'She will be late,' said Sir Thomas, taking out his watch. "'But what is your difficulty?' Edmund found himself obliged to speak, and fill up the blanks in his mother's story. He told the whole, and she had only to add, 
It's so strange, for Mrs. Grant never used to ask her. But is it not very natural, observed Edmund, that Mrs. Grant should wish to procure so agreeable a visitor for her sister? Nothing can be more natural, said Sir Thomas, after a short deliberation. Nor were there no sister in the case, could anything in my opinion be more natural. Mrs. Grant's showing civility to Miss Price, to Lady Bertram's niece, could never want explanation. The only surprise I can feel is that this should be the first time of its being paid. Fanny was perfectly right in giving only a conditional answer. She appears to feel as she ought. But as I conclude that she must wish to go, since all young people like to be together, I can see no reason why she should be denied the indulgence. But can I do without her, Sir Thomas? Indeed, I think you may. She always makes tea, you know, when my sister's not here. Your sister, perhaps, may be prevailed on to spend the day with us, and I shall certainly be at home. Very well, then. Fanny may go, Edmund. The good news soon followed her. Edmund knocked at her door in his way to his own. Well, Fanny, it is all happily settled, and without the smallest hesitation on your uncle's side. He had but one opinion. You are to go. Thank you. I am so glad was Fanny's instinctive reply, though when she had turned from him and shut the door, she could not help feeling. And yet why should I be glad? For am I not certain of seeing or hearing something there to pain me? In spite of this conviction, however, she was glad. Simple as such an engagement might appear in other eyes, it had novelty and importance in hers. For excepting the day at Southerton, she had scarcely ever dined out before and though now going only half a mile, and only to three people, still it was dining out, and all the little interests of preparation were enjoyments in themselves. She had neither sympathy nor assistance from those who ought to have entered into her feelings, and directed her taste, for Lady Bertram never thought of being useful to anybody, and Mrs. Norris, when she came on the morrow, in consequence of an early call and invitation from Sir Thomas, was in a very ill humour and seemed intent only on lessening her niece's pleasure, both present and future, as much as possible. "'Upon my word, Fanny, you are in high luck to meet with such attention and indulgence. You ought to be very much obliged to Mrs. Grant for thinking of you, and to your aunt for letting you go, and you ought to look upon it as something extraordinary, for I hope you are aware that there is no real occasion for your going into company in this sort of way, or ever dining out at all, and it is what you must not depend upon ever being repeated, nor must you be fancying that the invitation is meant as any particular compliment to you. The compliment is intended to your aunt, and uncle, and me.' mrs grant thinks it a civility due to us to take a little notice of you or else it would never have come into her head and you may be very certain that if your cousin julia had been at home you would not have been asked at all mrs norris had now so ingeniously done away all mrs grant's part of the favour that fanny who found herself expected to speak could only say that she was very much obliged to her aunt bertram for sparing her and that she was endeavouring to put her aunt's evening work in such a state as to prevent her being missed Oh, depend upon it, your aunt can do very well without you, or you would not be allowed to go. I shall be here, so you may be quite easy about your aunt, and I hope you will have a very agreeable day and find it all mighty delightful. But I must observe that five is the very awkwardest of all possible numbers to sit down to table, and I cannot but be surprised that such an elegant lady as Mrs. Grant should not contrive better, and round their enormous great wide table too, which fills up the room so dreadfully, had the doctor been contented to take my dining-table when I came away, as anybody in their senses would have done, instead of having that absurd new one of his own, which is is wider, literally wider, than the dinner-table here, how infinitely better it would have been, and how much more he would have been respected, for people are never respected when they step out of their proper sphere. Remember that, Fanny. Five, only five to be sitting round that table. However, you will have enough dinner on it for den, I dare say. Mrs. Norris fetched breath, and went on again. The nonsense and folly of people stepping out of their rank, and trying to appear above themselves, makes me think it right to give you a hint, Fanny, now that you are going into company without any of us, and I do beseech and entreat you not to be putting yourself forward, and talking and giving your opinion as if you were one of your cousins, as if you were dear Mrs. Rushworth or Julia. That will never do, believe me. Remember, wherever you are, you must be the lowest and last, and though Miss Crawford is in a manner at home at the passage, you are not to be taking place of her, and as to coming away at night, you are to stay just as long as Edmund chooses. Leave him to settle that. 
"'Yes, Mum, I should not think of anything else.' and if it should rain which i think exceedingly likely for i never saw it more threatening for a wet evening in my life you must manage as well as you can and not be expecting the carriage to be sent for you i certainly did not go home to-night and therefore the carriage will not be out on my account so you must make up your mind to what may happen and take your things accordingly her niece thought it perfectly reasonable she rated her own claims to comfort as low even as mrs norris could and when sir thomas soon afterwards just opening the door said fanny at what time would you have the carriage come round she felt a degree of astonishment which made it impossible for her to speak my dear sir thomas cried mrs norris red with anger fanny can walk walk repeated sir thomas in a tone of most unanswerable dignity and coming farther into the room my niece walk to a dinner engagement at this time of the year will twenty minutes after four suit you "'Yes, sir,' was Fanny's humble answer, given with the feelings almost of a criminal towards Mrs. Norris, and not bearing to remain with her in what might seem a state of triumph, she followed her uncle out of the room, having stayed behind him only long enough to hear these words spoken in angry agitation. "'Quite unnecessary! A great deal too kind! <gasps> but Edmund goes true! It is upon Edmund's account. I observed he was hoarse on Thursday night.' But this could not impose on Fanny. She felt that the carriage was for herself, and herself alone, and her uncle's consideration of her, coming immediately after such representations from her aunt, cost her some tears of gratitude when she was alone. The coachman drove round to a minute. Another minute brought down the gentleman, and as the lady had, with a most scrupulous fear of being late, been many minutes seated in the drawing-room, Sir Thomas saw them off in as good time as his own correctly punctual habits required. "'Now I must look at you, Fanny,' said Edmund, with the kind smile of an affectionate brother, "'and tell you how I like you. And as well as I can judge by this light, you look very nicely indeed. What have you got on?' "'The new dress that my uncle was so good as to give me on my cousin's marriage. I hope it is not too fine, but I thought I ought to wear it as soon as I could, and that I might not have such another opportunity all the winter. I hope you do not think me too fine. A woman can never be too fine when she's all in white. No, I see no finery about you, nothing but what is perfectly proper. Your gown seems very pretty. I like these glossy spots. Has not Miss Crawford a gown something the same? In approaching the parsonage they passed close by the stable-yard and coach-house. Heyday! said Edmund. "'Here's company! Here's a carriage! Who have they got to meet us?' And letting down the side-glass to distinguish. "'Tis Crawford's! Crawford's barouche, I protest! There are his two men pushing it back into its old quarters. He is here, of course. This is quite a surprise, Fanny. I shall be very glad to see him.' There was no occasion, there was no time for Fanny to say how very differently she felt, but the idea of having such another to observe her was a great increase of the trepidation with which she performed the very awful ceremony of walking into the drawing-room. In the drawing-room Mr. Crawford certainly was, having been just long enough arrived to be ready for dinner, and the smiles and pleased looks of the three others standing round him showed how welcome was his sudden resolution of coming to them for a few days on leaving Bath. A very cordial meeting passed between him and Edmund and with the exception of Fanny the pleasure was general, and even to her there might be some advantage in his presence, since every addition to the party must rather forward her favourite indulgence of being suffered to sit silent and unattended to. She was soon aware of this herself, for though she must submit, as her own propriety of mind directed, in spite of her aunt Norris's opinion, to being the principal lady in company, and to all the little distinctions consequent thereon, she found, while they were at table, such a happy flow of conversation prevailing, in which she was not required to take any part. There was so much to be said between the brother and sister about Bath, so much between the young men about hunting, so much of politics between Mr. Crawford and Dr. Grant, and of everything and altogether between Mr. Crawford and Mrs. Grant, as to leave her the fairest prospect of having only to listen in quiet, and of passing a very agreeable day. She could not compliment the newly arrived gentleman, however, with any appearance of interest, in a scheme for extending his stay at Mansfield, and sending for his hunters from Norfolk, which, suggested by Dr. Grant, advised by Edmund, and warmly urged by the two sisters, was soon in possession of his mind, 
and which he seemed to want to be encouraged even by her to resolve on. Her opinion was sought as to the probable continuance of the open weather, but her answers were as short and indifferent as civility allowed. She could not wish him to stay, and would much rather not have him speak to her. Her two absent cousins, especially Maria, were much in her thoughts on seeing him, but no embarrassing remembrance affected his spirits. Here he was again on the same ground where all had passed before, and apparently as willing to stay and be happy without the Miss Bertrams as if he had never known Mansfield in any other state. She heard them spoken of by him only in a general way, till they were all reassembled in the drawing-room, when Edmund, being engaged apart in some matter of business with Dr. Grant, which seemed entirely to engross them, and Mrs. Grant occupied at the tea-table, he began talking of them with more particularity to his other sister. With a significant smile, which made Fanny quite hate him, he said, "'So Rushworth and his fair bride are at Brighton, I understand. Happy man!' "'Yes, they have been there about a fortnight. Miss Price, have they not? And Julia is with them.' "'And Mr. Yates, I presume, is not far off?' "'Mr. Yates? Oh, we hear nothing of Mr. Yates. I do not imagine he figures much in the letters to Mansfield Park. Do you, Miss Price?' I think my friend Julia knows better than to entertain her father with Mr. Yates. Poor Rushworth and his two-and-forty speeches. Continued Crawford. Nobody can ever forget them, poor fellow. I see him now, his toil and his despair. Well, I am much mistaken if his lovely Maria will ever want him to make two-and-forty speeches to her. Adding with a momentary seriousness. She is too good for him, much too good and then changing his tone again to one of gentle gallantry, and addressing Fanny, he said, "'You were Mr. Rushworth's best friend. Your kindness and patience can never be forgotten. Your indefatigable patience in trying to make it possible for him to learn his part, in trying to give him a brain which nature had denied, to mix up an understanding for him out of the superfluity of your own. He might not have sense enough himself to estimate your kindness, but I may venture to say that it had honour from all the rest of the party.' Fanny coloured and said nothing. "'It is as a dream, a pleasant dream.' he exclaimed, breaking forth again after a few minutes musing. I shall always look back on our theatricals with exquisite pleasure. There was such an interest, such an animation, such a spirit diffused. Everybody felt it. We were all alive. There was employment, hope, solicitude, bustle for every hour of the day. Always some little objection, some little doubt, some little anxiety to be got over. I never was happier." With silent indignation Fanny repeated to herself, "'Never happier. Never happier than when doing what you must know was not justifiable. Never happier than when behaving so dishonourably and unfeelingly. Oh, what a corrupted mind!' "'We were unlucky, Miss Price,' he continued in a lower tone, to avoid the possibility of being heard by Edmund, and not at all aware of her feelings. We certainly were very unlucky. Another week, only one other week, would have been enough for us. I think if we had had the disposal of events, if Mansfield Park had had the government of the winds just for a week or two, about the equinox, there would have been a difference, not that we would have endangered his safety by any tremendous weather, but only by a steady contrary wind, or a calm. I think, Miss Price, we would have indulged ourselves with a week's calm in the Atlantic at that season." He seemed determined to be answered, and Fanny, averting her face, said with a firmer tone than usual, "'As far as I am concerned, sir, I would not have delayed his return for a day. My uncle disapproved it all so entirely when he did arrive, that in my opinion everything had gone quite far enough." She had never spoken so much at once to him in her life before, and never so angrily to any one and when her speech was over she trembled and blushed at her own daring. He was surprised, but after a few moments' silent consideration of her, replied in a calmer, graver tone, as if the candid result of conviction. "'I believe you are right. It was more pleasant than prudent. We were getting too noisy.' And then, turning the conversation, he would have engaged her on some other subject, but her answers were so shy and reluctant that he could not advance in any. Miss Crawford, who had been repeatedly eyeing Dr. Grant and Edmund, now observed, "'Those gentlemen must have some very interesting point to discuss.'
the most interesting in the world. Replied her brother. How to make money? How to turn a good income into a better? Doctor Grant is giving Bertram instructions about the living he is to step into so soon. I find he takes orders in a few weeks. They were at it in the dining parlour. I am glad to hear Bertram will be so well off. He will have a very pretty income to make ducks and drakes with, and earned without much trouble. I apprehend he will not have less than seven hundred a year. Seven hundred a year is a fine thing for a younger brother, and as of course he will still live at home, it will be all for his minus plaisirs, and a sermon at Christmas and Easter, I suppose, will be the sum total of sacrifice. His sister tried to laugh off her feelings by saying. Nothing amuses me more than the easy manner with which everybody settles the abundance of those who have a great deal less than themselves. You would look rather blank, Henry, if your menu plays here were to be limited to seven hundred a year. Perhaps I might, but all that you know is entirely comparative. Birthright and habit must settle the business. Bertram is certainly well off for a cadet of even a baronet's family. By the time he is four or five and twenty, he will have seven hundred a year. And nothing to do for it. Miss Crawford could have said that there would be a something to do and to suffer for it, which she could not think lightly of. But she checked herself and let it pass, and tried to look calm and unconcerned when the two gentlemen shortly afterwards joined them. Bertram said Henry Crawford, "I shall make a point of coming to Mansfield to hear you preach your first sermon. I shall come on purpose to encourage a young beginner. When is it to be, Miss Price? Will you not join me in encouraging your cousin?" Will not you engage to attend with your eyes steadily fixed on him the whole time, as I shall do, not to lose a word, or only looking off just to note down any sentence preeminently beautiful? We will provide ourselves with tablets and a pencil. When will it be? You must preach at Mansfield, you know, that Sir Thomas and Lady Bertram may hear you. I shall keep clear of you, Crawford, as long as I can," said Edmund. For you would be more likely to disconcert me, and I should be more sorry to see you trying at it than almost any other man. Will he not feel this? Thought Fanny. No, he can feel nothing as he ought. The party being now all united, and the chief talkers attracting each other, she remained in tranquillity, and as a whist table was formed after tea, formed really for the amusement of Doctor Grant by his attentive wife, though it was not to be supposed so. And Miss Crawford took her harp. She had nothing to do but to listen, and her tranquillity remained undisturbed the rest of the evening, except when Mr. Crawford now and then addressed to her a question or observation which she could not avoid answering. Miss Crawford was too much vexed by what had passed to be in humour for anything but music. With that, she soothed herself and amused her friend. The assurance of Edmund's being so soon to take orders, coming upon her like a blow that had been suspended. And still hoped uncertain and at a distance, was felt with resentment and mortification. She was very angry with him. She had thought her influence more. She had begun to think of him. She felt that she had, with great regard, with almost decided intentions. But she would now meet him with his own cool feelings. It was plain that he could have no serious views, no true attachment, by fixing himself in a situation which he must know she would never stoop to. She would learn to match him in his indifference. She would henceforth admit his attentions without any idea beyond immediate amusement. If he could so command his affections, hers should do her no harm. End of chapter twenty-three. Of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Henry Crawford had quite made up his mind by the next morning to give another fortnight to Mansfield, and having sent for his hunters and written a few lines of explanation to the admiral, he looked round at his sister as he sealed and threw the letter from him, and seeing the coast clear of the rest of the family, said with a smile, "And how do you think I mean to amuse myself, Mary, on the days that I do not hunt?" I am grown too old to go out more than three times a week, but I have a plan for the intermediate days. And what do you think it is? To walk and ride with me, to be sure. Not exactly, though I shall be happy to do both. But that would be exercise only to my body, and I must take care of my mind. 
Besides, that would be all recreation and indulgence, without the wholesome alloy of labour. And I do not like to eat the bread of idleness. No, my plan is to make Fanny Price in love with me. Fanny Price? Nonsense. No, no. You ought to be satisfied with her two cousins. But I cannot be satisfied without Fanny Price, without making a small hole in Fanny Price's heart. You do not seem properly aware of her claims to notice. When we talked of her last night, you none of you seemed sensible of the wonderful improvement that has taken place in her looks within the last six weeks. You see her every day, and therefore do not notice it, but I assure you she is quite a different creature from what she was in the autumn. She was then merely a quiet, modest, not plain-looking girl, but she is now absolutely pretty. I used to think she had neither complexion nor countenance, but in that soft skin of hers, so frequently tinged with a blush as it was yesterday, there is decided beauty, and from what I observed of her eyes and mouth, I do not despair of their being capable of expression enough when she has anything to express. And then her air, her manner, her tout ensemble, is so indescribably improved, she must have grown two inches at least since October. Foo foo! This is only because there were no tall women to compare her with, and because she has got a new gown, and you never saw her so well dressed before. She is just what she was in October, believe me. The truth is that she was the only girl in company for you to notice, and you must have a somebody. I have always thought her pretty, not strikingly pretty, but pretty enough, as people say, a sort of beauty that grows on one. Her eyes should be darker, but she has a sweet smile. But as for this wonderful degree of improvement, I am sure it may all be resolved into a better style of dress, and your having nobody else to look at. And therefore, if you do set about a flirtation with her, you never will persuade me that it is in compliment to her beauty, or that it proceeds from anything but your own idleness and folly." Her brother gave only a smile to this accusation and soon afterwards said, "'I do not quite know what to make of Miss Fanny. I do not understand her. I could not tell what she would be at yesterday. What is her character? Is she solemn? Is she queer? Is she prudish? Why did she draw back and look so grave at me? I could hardly get her to speak. I never was so long in company with a girl in my life trying to entertain her, and succeed so ill.' Never met with a girl who looks so grave on me. I must try to get the better of this. Her looks say, I will not like you, I am determined not to like you, and I say she shall. Foolish fellow! And so this is her attraction after all. This it is, her not caring about you, which gives her such a soft skin, and makes her so much taller, and produces all these charms and graces. I do desire that you will not be making her really unhappy. A little love, perhaps, may animate and do her good, but I will not have you plunge her deep, for she is as good a little creature as ever lived, and has a great deal of feeling." "'It can be but for a fortnight,' said Henry. "'And if a fortnight can kill her, she must have a constitution which nothing could save. No, I will not do her any harm, dear little soul only want her to look kindly on me, to give me smiles as well as blushes, to keep a chair for me by herself whenever we are, and be all animation when I take it and talk to her, to think as I think, be interested in all my possessions and pleasures, try to keep me longer at Mansfield, and feel when I go away that she shall never be happy again. I want nothing more." "'Moderation itself,' said Mary. "'I can have no scruples now. Well, you will have opportunities enough of endeavouring to recommend yourself, for we are a great deal together." And without attempting any farther remonstrance, she left Fanny to her fate, a fate which, had not Fanny's heart been guarded in a way unsuspected by Miss Crawford, might have been a little harder than she deserved, for although there doubtless are such unconquerable young ladies of eighteen, or one should not read about them, as are never to be persuaded into love against their judgment by all that talent, manner, attention, and flattery can do, I have no inclination to believe Fanny one of them, 
or to think that with so much tenderness of disposition, and so much taste as belonged to her, she could have escaped heart whole from the courtship, though the courtship only of a fortnight, of such a man as Crawford, in spite of there being some previous ill opinion of him to be overcome, had not her affection been engaged elsewhere. With all the security which love of another and disesteem of him could give to the peace of mind he was attacking, his continued attentions, continued but not obtrusive, and adapting themselves more and more to the gentleness and delicacy of her character, obliged her very soon to dislike him less than formerly. She had by no means forgotten the past, and she thought as ill of him as ever, but she felt his powers. He was entertaining, and his manners were so improved, so polite, so seriously and blamelessly polite, that it was impossible not to be civil to him in return. A very few days were enough to effect this, and at the end of those few days circumstances arose which had a tendency rather to forward his views of pleasing her, inasmuch as they gave her a degree of happiness which must dispose her to be pleased with everybody. William, her brother, the so long absent and dearly loved brother, was in England again. She had a letter from him herself, a few hurried happy lines, written as the ship came up channel, and sent into Portsmouth with the first boat that left the Antwerp at anchor in Spithead, and when Crawford walked up with the newspaper in his hand, which he had hoped would bring the first tidings, he found her trembling with joy over this letter, and listening with a glowing grateful countenance to the kind invitation which her uncle was most collectedly dictating in reply. It was but the day before that Crawford had made himself thoroughly master of the subject, or had in fact become at all aware of her having such a brother, or his being in such a ship, but the interest then excited had been very properly lively, determining him on his return to town to apply for information as to the probable period of the Antwerp's return from the Mediterranean, etc., and the good luck which attended his early examination of ship news the next morning seemed the reward of his ingenuity in finding out such a method of pleasing her, as well as of his dutiful attention to the admiral, in having for many years taken in the paper esteemed to have the earliest naval intelligence. He proved, however, to be too late. All those fine first feelings, of which he had hoped to be the exciter, were already given. But his intention, the kindness of his intention, was thankfully acknowledged, quite thankfully and warmly, for she was elevated beyond the common timidity of her mind by the flow of her love for William. This dear William would soon be amongst them. There could be no doubt of his obtaining leave of absence immediately, for he was still only a midshipman, and as his parents, from living on the spot, must already have seen him, and be seeing him perhaps daily, his direct holidays might with justice be instantly given to the sister who had been his best correspondent through a period of seven years, and the uncle who had done most for his support and advancement, and accordingly the reply to her reply, fixing a very early day for his arrival, came as soon as possible, and scarcely ten days had passed since Fanny had been in the agitation of her first dinner visit, when she found herself in an agitation of a higher nature, watching in the hall, in the lobby, on the stairs, for the first sound of the carriage which was to bring her a brother. It came happily while she was thus waiting, and there being neither ceremony nor fearfulness to delay the moment of meeting, she was with him as he entered the house, and the first minutes of exquisite feeling had no interruption and no witnesses, unless the servants chiefly intent upon opening the proper doors could be called such. This was exactly what Sir Thomas and Edmund had been separately contriving at, as each proved to the other by the sympathetic alacrity with which they both advised Mrs. Norris's continuing where she was, instead of rushing out into the hall as soon as the noises of the arrival reached them. William and Fanny soon showed themselves, and Sir Thomas had the pleasure of receiving in his protégé certainly a very different person from the one he had equipped seven years ago, but a young man of an open, pleasant countenance, and frank, unstudied, but feeling and respectful manners, and such as confirmed him his friend. It was long before Fanny could recover from the agitating happiness of such an hour as was formed by the last thirty minutes of expectation, and the first of fruition. It was some time even before her happiness could be said to make her happy, before the disappointment inseparable from the alteration of person had vanished, and she could see in him the same William as before, and talk to him, as her heart had been yearning to do through many a past year. That time, however, did gradually come 
forwarded by an affection on his side as warm as her own, and much less encumbered by refinement or self-distrust. She was the first object of his love, but it was a love which his stronger spirits and bolder temper made it as natural for him to express as to feel. On the morrow they were walking about together with true enjoyment, and every succeeding morrow renewed a tete-a-tete, -tete, which Sir Thomas could not but observe with complacency, even before Edmund had pointed it out to him. Excepting the moments of peculiar delight which any marked or unlooked-for instance of Edmund's consideration of her in the last few months had elicited, Fanny had never known so much felicity in her life, as in this unchecked, equal, fearless intercourse with the brother and friend who was opening all his heart to her, telling her all his hopes and fears, plans and solicitudes respecting that long thought of, dearly earned, and justly valued blessing of promotion, who could give her direct and minute information of the father and mother, brothers and sisters, of whom she very seldom heard, who was interested in all the comforts and all the little hardships of her home at Mansfield, ready to think of every member of that home as she directed, or differing only by a less scrupulous opinion and more noisy abuse of their aunt Norris, and with whom, perhaps the dearest indulgence of the whole, all the good and evil of their earliest years could be gone over again, and every former united pain and pleasure retraced with the fondest recollection. An advantage this, a strengthener of love, in which even the conjugal tie is beneath the fraternal. Children of the same family, the same blood, with the same first associations and habits, have some means of enjoyment in their power, which no subsequent connections can supply, and it must be by a long and unnatural estrangement, by a divorce which no subsequent connection can justify, if such precious remains of the earliest attachments are ever entirely outlived. Too often, alas, it is so. Fraternal love, sometimes almost everything, is at others worse than nothing. But with William and Fanny Price it was still a sentiment in all its prime and freshness, wounded by no opposition of interest, cooled by no separate attachment, and feeling the influence of time and absence only in its increase. An affection so amiable was advancing each in the opinion of all who had hearts to value anything good. Henry Crawford was as much struck with it as any. He honoured the warm-hearted, blunt fondness of the young sailor, which led him to say, with his hand stretched towards Fanny's head, "'Do you know, I begin to like that queer fashion already. Though when I first heard of such things being done in England, I could not believe it. And when Mrs. Brown and the other women at the commissioners at Gibraltar appeared in the same trim, I thought they were mad. But Fanny can reconcile me to anything.' and saw with lively admiration the glow of Fanny's cheek, the brightness of her eye, the deep interest, the absorbed attention, while her brother was describing any of the imminent hazards or terrific scenes which such a period at sea must supply. It was a picture which Henry Crawford had moral taste enough to value. Fanny's attractions increased, increased twofold, for the sensibility which beautified her complexion and illumined her countenance was an attraction in itself. He was no longer in doubt of the capabilities of her heart. She had feeling, genuine feeling. It would be something to be loved by such a girl, to excite the first ardours of her young, unsophisticated mind. She interested him more than he had foreseen. A fortnight was not enough. His stay became indefinite. William was often called on by his uncle to be the talker. His recitals were amusing in themselves to Sir Thomas, but the chief object in seeking them was to understand the reciter, to know the young man by his histories, and he listened to his clear, simple, spirited details with full satisfaction, seeing in them the proof of good principles, professional knowledge, energy, courage, and cheerfulness, everything that could deserve or promise well. Young as he was, William had already seen a great deal. He had been in the Mediterranean, in the West Indies, in the Mediterranean again, had been often taken on shore by the favour of his captain, and in the course of seven years had known every variety of danger which sea and war together could offer. With such means in his power he had a right to be listened to, and though Mrs. Norris could fidget about the room, and disturb everybody in quest of two needlefuls of thread, or a second-hand shirt-button, in the midst of her nephew's account of a shipwreck or an engagement, everybody else was attentive and even Lady Bertram could not hear of such horrors unmoved, 
or without sometimes lifting her eyes from her work to say, "'Dear me, how disagreeable! I wonder. Anybody can ever go to sea.' To Henry Crawford they gave a different feeling. He longed to have been at sea, and seen and done and suffered as much. His heart was warmed, his fancy fired, and he felt the highest respect for a lad who, before he was twenty, had gone through such bodily hardships and given such proofs of mind. The glory of heroism, of usefulness, of exertion, of endurance, made his own habits of selfish indulgence appear in shameful contrast, and he wished he had been a William Price, distinguishing himself and working his way to fortune and consequence with so much self-respect and happy ardour, instead of what he was. The wish was rather eager than lasting. He was roused from the reverie of retrospection and regret produced by it, by some inquiry from Edmund as to his plans for the next day's hunting, and he found it was as well to be a man of fortune at once with horses and grooms at his command. In one respect it was better, as it gave him the means of conferring a kindness where he wished to oblige. With spirits, courage, and curiosity up to anything, William expressed an inclination to hunt and Crawford could mount him without the slightest inconvenience to himself, and with only some scruples to obviate in Sir Thomas, who knew better than his nephew the value of such a loan, and some alarms to reason away in Fanny. She feared for William, by no means convinced by all that he could relate of his own horsemanship in various countries, of the scrambling parties in which he had been engaged, the rough horses and mules he had ridden, or his many narrow escapes from dreadful falls, that he was at all equal to the management of a high-fed hunter in an English fox-chase, nor, till he returned safe and well, without accident or discredit, could she be reconciled to the risk, or feel any of that obligation to Mr. Crawford, for lending the horse which he had fully intended it should produce. When it was proved, however, to have done William no harm, she could allow it to be a kindness, and even reward the owner with a smile when the animal was one minute tendered to his use again, and the next, with the greatest cordiality, and in a manner not to be resisted, made over to his use entirely so long as he remained in Northamptonshire. End of chapter 24